Glory to God. The last time I spoke here, I spoke on the Word and being rooted in the Word of God. I want to continue tonight on the Word, but stepping into the Word and stepping into the Word with expectation, with anticipation. A lot of people don't even read the Word. They have not a clue what it says. Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Nathan, would you take that back and give that to Pastor? <laughs> People don't, you know, they don't think that the, the importance of the word, they don't understand the importance of the word, they don't even have a clue how the word can impact their life. But if your heart is after the things of God, if you want to know his ways, if you want to say, not my will, God, but thy will, then prepare to be changed when you read his word. We should read with the anticipation and the expectation that we are going to change. Amen. So turn to Hebrews 4.12. Most of my scriptures tonight are out of the Amplified. The word needs to touch us and will touch us if we let it. If we let God's word, it will touch us. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God that speaks is alive and full of power, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating to the dividing line of the breath of life, soul, and the immortal spirit, and of joints and marrow, one of the deepest parts of our nature exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. Wow. It is energizing. And it's effective. Amen. It's effective. Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing where I sent it. There is a tremendous amount of energy in God's word. Tremendous amount. God said, let there be light. And there was. I mean, when God created this earth and all that's in here and our universe, I don't believe for one second that it was quiet. I believe that it was loud. There was a lot going on in creation. Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. As we read God's word, it has the power and the capability of reaching to to the very depth of our soul, our being. The word of God will change us and transform us. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, this age, fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed, changed, by the entire renewal of your mind, by its new ideals and its new attitudes, so that you may prove for yourself what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. 
God is the only one that is holy and perfect, and so is his word. If we grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus, then change must come. Amen. Change must come. Change doesn't always feel good. Change doesn't always sound good. But it's like good medicine. Oh, it may be bitter when it goes down. But oh, what a difference it makes. Medicine does that. God's word can be like that. We may not like God's word, what it's saying. We may get our feathers all in a fluff and find that we are actually offended by God's word. Now, there is a word that's been thrown around lately. Boy, every time you turn on the news, every time you go to Facebook, somebody is getting offended. We have a choice to make with God's word. Yieldedness and obedience or being offended, resistance, and rejecting the very word of God. We may find ourselves resisting what God's word is attempting to do in our life. We may be very afraid of what may happen if we yield to it. We can always trust God. We should never be afraid of what God is doing in our life. We may think that uh, a particular scripture, oh, that can't be for me. Oh, but boy, do I know who that's for. They should have been in church. In fact, that person needs to come to our church so they can hear it because they would really benefit from it. But we close it off to us. God's word is refined seven times. There's a level in God's word that needs to minister to us, and we need to be open and receptive to that. We need to experience a complete change and a complete renovation, if you will. Our life, our will, must change. When a home is renovated, what happens? Nine times out of ten, it's gutted out. The walls on the inside are taken out, removed. And when that happens, it exposes everything that's been hidden behind the walls. Asbestos, mold, mice. Anything. I mean, there could be a lot of stuff that's hidden behind the walls. Well, there's a scripture in, in God's word, and I believe it's Psalm 139. But it says, our walls are ever before him. Our walls are ever before him. God knows what our walls are made up of, and he knows everything that is hiding behind our walls. All the stuff that we came into God's family with. He wants to renovate our total life. He wants to renovate our minds, our thinking. He wants us to, to live and move and have our very being in him. Not in the things of the world, not in the old nature that we came from. God's word can change a prideful soul and make it humble. A perverse spirit and make it meek. Oh, thank goodness for his patience and his gentleness as he brings us into wholeness. I don't think I'd survive one big swoop. I mean, if you ask Pastor Sharon and Pastor George, when I came into this ministry 26 years ago, oh, did I cut a lot of baggage. <laughs> I was wounded. I was hurt. I mean, but God in his mercy and grace and for the sound doctrine and the teaching that's come off of this pulpit, you know, God has changed me. But yet I had to yield to that change. I had to want that change. The word of God will continually perfect us until we are finally at home with the Lord. Ephesians 5, 25 and 27. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and he gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with a washing of water by the word. I mean, you could take that and just like scrub your brain with God's word. I take that literally. And that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, 
but as it should be holy and without blemish. Now the word of God will move you and I. It'll move us. James 1.22, but be ye doers of the word. Obey the message, not merely listeners to it. Betraying, I love this in the Amplified, betraying yourselves into deception by reasoning contrary to the truth. What does that mean? Well, as I was pondering that and how to bring that out, the Lord just showed me one of the papers I did was on alcoholism. And I've known different people over, over my life that have had a problem with alcohol. When someone is an alcoholic, when they finally realize, I have a problem, I need help, and they may go to AA, they may go to a recovery program, and however they do it, but they're going to all the meetings, they're there, they're realizing, I have a problem, I need help. And they're, uh, they're realizing they're no different than anyone else here. We come from all walks of life. But we, I still have a problem, and so do they. But then all of a sudden, as time goes on, we betray ourselves with deceptive thinking. I really don't have a problem. I really don't have... I mean, I am not like those other people. I am not like them at all. I really don't need to be going to these meetings. And before you know it, what happens? Boy, all of a sudden, we are back at square one. We're back at square one. So let me read that again. Be doers of the word, obey the message, and not merely listeners to it, betraying yourselves into deception by reasoning contrary to the truth. We need to act on the word of God. Mental assent does nothing but admire. We can have all the mental assent about God's word, and unless we act on it, it's nothing. There's no action in there. When we are acting on God's word, we are actually allowing Jesus himself to work through us and out through us. Let's go to Luke chapter 6, verses 47 through 49. For everyone who comes to me and listens to my word in order to heed their teaching and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug and went deep and laid a foundation upon the rock and when the flood arose, a torrent broke against that house and could not shake it or move it because it had been securely built and founded on a rock. But he who merely hears and does not practice doing my word is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation against which the torrent burst and immediately it collapsed and fell and breaking and ruin of that house was great. The wise man dug deep. He had already heard from God and then he put it into action. He acted on it and the floods came. There must be obedience to his word. I got thinking, what would have happened if Noah had betrayed himself in deceptive reasoning? God wants that much pitch on the, oh, we don't need that much. Let's thin it down a little bit. And he wants what kind of wood? Oh, that's going to be too hard to cut. What if he decided that God's measurements and everything that God had laid down for him exactly, that he was going to change it? Then the floods came. His disobedience wouldn't have kept the floods from coming. He would 
could have been in a sad state of affairs. Because that, that ark would not have lasted very long. It wouldn't have lasted at all. And I'm very grateful that he was obedient to the word of God. There's many too, too many people. Too many. They're not in church. They're not reading God's word. They're missing out like big time. And they don't even know. Oh, I, and I've heard it many times. Oh, I pray. I say my prayers every night. You know, you don't have to go to church to say your prayers. Well, of course not. I pray in my house all the time. But I couldn't imagine not coming to church, not knowing that I have got you by my side. We stand together in unity in one accord. You know, one, when one is weak, the others come along and stand you up and, and strengthen you. You know, that if we get down, if I got sick, I know you guys would be praying for me. I'd like to give a quote that Pastor George gave quite a while back, but I don't know exactly which message it was. But he said, many who have said, I don't need church. I love Jesus and he is with me. They will only come to know that God is with them to the degree that they are with him in obedience. Think about that. There's going to be a lot of people that's going to have a rude wake-up call when they stand before the Lord because they think they're doing fine. They have a mental ascent of Jesus' existence, and that's it. It's a mental ascent. Obedience is a word that demands action on our part. There has to be action to our faith in God and action to his word. John 1.16, out of the Amplified. For out of his fullness, abundance, we have all received, all had a share, and we were all supplied with one grace after another, spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing, and even favor upon favor, and gift, heat upon gift. I don't know about you as far as this scripture and how it makes you feel, but it makes me more confident, and there's more action in my walk when I look at this because I'm strengthened in my identity of who Christ is in me, and his grace is there. And it's one grace after another and spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing. It doesn't stop our whole walk with God here on this earth. As we walk in obedience, it's one blessing after another. Grace after grace. Gift heaped upon gift. I mean, that's awesome. Now, God's word will teach us and guide us. Proverbs 3, 1 through 10. My son, forget not my law or teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life worth living and tranquility, inward and outward and continuing through old age till death. Shall these be added to you? Let not mercy and kindness, shutting out all hatred and selfishness, and truth, shutting out all deliberate hypocrisy and falsehood, forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablets of your heart. That's memory work. So shall you find favor and good understanding and high esteem in the sight or judgment of God and man. Lean not. Lean on and trust in and be confident in the Lord with all your heart and mind. And do not rely on your own insight or un understanding. In all your ways, Know, recognize, acknowledge him, and he will direct and make straight and plain your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Reverently fear and worship the Lord. Turn entirely away from evil. It shall be health to your nerves and sinews and marrow and moistening to your bones. 
Honor the Lord with your capital and sufficiency from righteous labors and with the first fruits of all your income. So shall your storage places be filled with plenty and your vats shall be overflowing with new wine. This, these 10 verses covers a lot of area in what it teaches and how it guides us to live our life according to God's word. Psalms 25, 4 and 5 in the King James says, Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy path. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. For thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. God's word teaches us how to stand strong in the face of adversity. God's word teaches us that we are healed. And we were healed at the cross of Calvary. God's word teaches us how to walk by faith and not by sight. It's not what, by what we, you and I, see in the natural. What God is doing in the spirit realm is far of a greater truth than what we see in the natural. So I'm going to choose to believe his word. You know, I think of what happened, you know, in the story of Esther. We just finished in Children's Church the story of Esther this morning. And, and even though there was a lot going on in there with Esther and Mordecai and Haman with his evil acts, but God was behind the scenes and he was orchestrating and moving and bringing everything to pass because he knew what the outcome, he had an expectation of how that outcome was going to be. No one else knew. If they would have known, Esther would have said, well, I don't need to fast and pray. I don't need to have the people fast and pray. But they couldn't see, like God could see, the beginning and the end of all that. So I'm going to choose to believe and to be as obedient as I can to God's word. God's word teaches me that he will supply all my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. I'll tell you, he does not let you down. If you lean on him and trust in him, I will tell you, he will provide all your needs. He will. God's word teaches that he is the only God and there is none other. And he also teaches me that he's coming back for me and you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119, 30. I have chosen the way of truth and faithfulness. Your ordinances have I set before me. 119, 11. Your word have I laid up in my heart that I might not sin against you. Again, memory work. Then God's word will delight you. It'll bring delight in your heart. Psalm 1, 1 through 3 in the Amplified. Blessed, happy, fortunate, prosperous, and enviable is the man who walks and lives not in the counsel of the ungodly, following their advice and their plans and purposes, nor stands submissive and inactive, in the path where sinners walk, nor sits down to relax and rest where the scornful and the mockers gather. But his delight and desire are in the law of the Lord and on his law, the precepts, the instructions, the teaching of God. He habitually meditates, ponders, and studies by day and by night. If there was anything to meditate on, God's word is the only thing that we're ever told to meditate on. And he shall be like a tree firmly planted and tended by the streams of water, ready to bring forth its fruit in its season. Its leaf also shall not fade or wither, and everything he does shall prosper and come to maturity. This only comes, if, if you read in through verse 1, what I see in there is absolute yieldedness and obedience to God's word.
Psalm 119, 77. Let your tender mercy and loving kindness come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. Psalm 119, 140. I endorse and delight in the law of the Lord in my innermost self, with my new nature. And Psalm 119, 143. Trouble and anguish have found and taken hold on me, yet your commandments are my delight. And Romans 7, 22. I endorse and delight in the law of the Lord in my innermost self, The word of God will break us. It will break us. And we may say, oh, that sounds so painful, though. But if we yield, if we yield to him in obedience and out of love, we will be so glad we yielded to him and that he was willing to break us because we come forth afresh and anew. In the first part of Jeremiah, he says in 23, Jeremiah 23, verse 29a, is not my word like fire that consumes all that cannot endure the test, says the Lord? In Proverbs 28, 14, he said, Blessed, happy, and fortunate to be envied is the man who reverently and worshipfully fears the Lord at all times, regardless of circumstances. But he who hardens his heart will fall, in, fall into calamity. Now I'm going to get back to Jeremiah 23, the second part of verse 29. But if we don't reverently and worshipfully fear the Lord, his word won't be important to us either. They go hand in hand. <clears throat> There's a song, I don't know about you, but when we sing praise and worship, I take many of those words so to heart. It's the, the cry of my heart when I'm worshiping God. And, you know, it says, is my word not like fire? And the song we sing is, refine me, O consuming fire, purify my heart's desire, melt away all selfishness, Leaving only righteousness, walking in integrity, holiness and purity, drawing ever near to thee, all-consuming fire. That's my heart. When I sing that song, that's my heart to God. I want everything that would separate me from him. I want it out of my life. I don't want it part of my life. I don't want to walk in the flesh. I want to walk after the things of the Spirit. So where you go? Who you hang around with? What do you watch on the, the Internet? What do you watch on TV? That all affects. Do you protect it? Do you protect what God has placed in you? Because it's important, we should. The scripture says, guard your heart with all diligence. As we read God's word and chew on it and mull over it and meditate on it, it will break a hardened heart. Then when that happens, the potter can now mold and shape these vessels into vessels of honor. Into vessels of honor. You know, then he goes in Jeremiah 23, 29, the last half, and like a hammer that breaks in pieces the rock of most stubborn resistance. God wants to break any area of our heart that we won't yield to him. He wants that. A lot of times we, oh, that's too ugly, that's, that's just too, I, I don't want anyone to see it. Don't worry, he sees it anyway. But a lot of times people have that thought, especially a new Christian. They'll come into the kingdom and from where they've come from, there's things that they've done and said and 
it's so ugly that they're ashamed. And so they don't want any part of that. They hide it. They bury it. But God knows it's there. You can't hide anything from God. And he will break the hardest heart and he will soften it so he can work with it. You know, when we sing the songs like, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, the vessel of honor, unto God. You know, those are important words in those songs. It's the heart of the song. It's the heart of the worshiper that wants to be that vessel of honor, that they are yielded to God, that they are molded and changes. They're yielding in obedience to God, that he will fashion them and shape them into what he wants. He will break old habits, melt away the selfishness, break us from wrong teaching. You know, when you come into the kingdom of God from um, sometimes a mainline denomination, there's teachings that don't line up with God's word. He wants our will to match his. He wants us to be able to be with every part, every part of our being, like Jesus was in the garden. Not my will, but thy will. And God's word will impact us. As we get into his word, our lives will be impacted on the very words of the pages. They're not just a typeset on a piece of paper. They're God's word. They're his spoken word. And it'll go from logos into rima. It'll literally become alive. Alive. And it will impact the very fabric of our being. And I've shared with you about how God delivered me from my fear of death and dying. I mean, I was afraid of dying. I mean, I was petrified. And I was also afraid of being around death. But God had to deliver me from that. And he did it with one scripture. 2 Corinthians 5.8, to be absent from the body is in the presence of the Lord. I mean, I'd read that scripture before, but my heart wasn't ready for what God was going to do that minute. And that fast, that scripture jumped off that page, and I'll tell you, I had me a party. Because it's, I mean, he delivered me totally. And it doesn't matter what holds us into bondage. God will use his word to bring us deliverance so that we can be that vessel that he wants to use. It'll change our identity of who we are, of who we are and by what we're reading. So we can boldly and firmly say, I am who God says that I am. I can be what God says that I can be. I can have what God says that I can have. I'm not weak. I've got God's strength. I'm not poor. I have God's riches. Oh, I have his health. I'm not sick because I'm God's child. God knows it. I know it. So does the devil. Then God's word will inspire us. Our founding fathers were inspired by the holy word of God. The very fabric and the foundation of our constitution was because our founding fathers who wrote the preamble, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Our Independence, it was all inspired by the holy word of God. So what if, what if our leaders today believed in God's word and was inspired by his word and then acted on it. Oh, just think about that. What if every Bible-believing Christian was inspired by what they read in God's word to vote and then voted biblically? What, what would our nation look like if we all believed that the Bible was not just a book full of words 
but it laid the foundation of how we were to live our daily life. Wow! America would look different. What if that we were so inspired as a nation by God's word that we were to believe that we are fearfully and wonderfully made and that life begins at conception. Amen? Amen. Oh, and the what ifs could go on and on. God's word can bring inspiration into our life. Jeremiah 29, 11. Pastor Lou. There's an expected end for our life that God wants. And then I've got to follow it with Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's a promise. The work he started in you from the moment you received Jesus as your Savior, God's not going to ease up. Ah, they're not moving fast enough for me. God's not like that. He's so full of passion and love and, and just patience, and he just brings us along. I love it in the Amplified. I am convinced and sure of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue it until the day of Jesus Christ, right up to the time of his return. Developing that good work and perfecting and it bringing it into com full completion in you. And then John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives. Give I unto you. Let your heart not be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. We should never walk in fear. If all of a sudden we're seeing too much news and too much on the internet and, uh, and you know, too much negativity on Facebook, and it's like it can start you thinking, what's going to happen? I, I, I don't want to go to the store. I don't want to do this and I don't want to do that. And we need to get in God's word and build ourselves up. Build yourself up. Pray in the spirit. God's word. That's, this is where the buck stops, right here. This is it. This is it. And then God's word will humble you. Jesus is our model in how to be humble. We see it in God's word just as he, he came not to be served, but to serve. We must commit ourselves to serving others. In all the lowliness of mind, always considering others better than ourselves. Philippians 2 3. Do nothing from factional motive, through contentiousness, strife, selfishness, or for unworthy ends, were prompted by conceit or empty arrogance. Instead, in the true spirit of humility, lowliness of mind, let each regard the others as better than and superior to himself thinking more highly of one another than you do of yourself. That kind of attitude goes before ambition, conceit, our striving, our self-justification of why we need to do something, self-defense. A truly humble person does not defend himself when he's falsely accused or unjustly treated. Jesus showed us that. <clears throat> he defends the truth but not with his own ego or reputation Jesus was not ashamed to humble himself as a servant I'm not going to go through the scriptures but in John 13 1 through 16 you can read that later it's all about when Jesus washed the feet of his disciples he went around and washed their feet and Peter's reaction Peter was one that always spoke out but I have a feeling that Peter speaking out really emulated what all the other disciples were thinking he's washing our feet our master our rabbi our teacher he's washing our dirty feet and so Peter had to be the one to speak up 
Jesus said, you need to humble yourself. Because Peter said, you're not going to wash my feet. If I don't wash your feet, Peter, then you have nothing to do with me. Oh, then my head, my feet, my body, everything. But he was learning. He was learning. Philippians 2.8. After he had appeared in human form, he abased and humbled himself still further and carried his obedience to the extreme death even to the death of the cross. In his humility, he was always obedient to the Father, and so should the humble Christian. Be willing to put aside all selfishness and submit in yieldedness and obedience to God and his word. True humility does produce godliness, contentment, and security. So I pray that as you Open up, and I pray that you're in God's word each day, that as you open up and you get ready to read his word, that you go into it with an anticipation that God is going to speak to you from his word, that you have that expectancy, because that expectation will touch you. It'll change you and transform you. It'll move you into action. It'll change us and transform us. Teach us and guide us. Delight us. It will break us. Thank you, Lord. It'll impact us. It'll inspire us. And it will humble us. It will. Praise God. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for your precious, precious word. There is nothing like it. As many people have tried to destroy it over the years, Lord, you've always protected your word. And I am so grateful that we live in a nation that we can have your word in such abundance. Oh, Father, I so thank you. I thank you. Father, I lift our government up in every aspect, local, national, and Father, inspire them. Inspire them that they would respond according to your word. That some way, somehow, that your word would impact their life to the point that they would actually change their politics. And oh, Father, I just so thank you for each one of my brothers and sisters. I so thank you, Father. And I praise you, Father. And I give you glory. I give you glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. I will tell you, I was impressed as I was praying that you who may be hearing this message, whether on the internet, television, whatever avenue you may hear it, God has got a plan and purpose for you. He's got a plan and purpose for you. And Satan will try to destroy your life. Let that never happen. Because God has great things planned for you. He's got an expected outcome. And he's well able to bring it to pass. And if you have never received Jesus as your Savior, then I would ask that you just go before him in prayer, that you seek his forgiveness for sin, be washed clean by that precious blood of Jesus. And then give him your heart. Give him your life. And then get in God's word. Get a Bible and read it. And let it minister to you. Let it minister to you. Because it's powerful. And it will get into the deep recesses of your heart and mind and change you so that you can fulfill the plan and purposes of God. If you don't have a home church, we're at 4870 Janelle, Las Vegas, 89149. 
you come and be part of our church. We would love to have you be here so that we can love on you. Give us a call, 702-631-5027. If you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior in praying that prayer just now, you call us. Leave a message with your name and number, and we will get back with you. But never forget how much God loves you. God loves you so much. He loves you so much. Don't let Satan destroy all that God has for you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Join us for services at Wellspring Church of All Nations, a dynamic church that lifts up the name of Jesus. We are meeting at 4870 Janelle Drive, located between Buffalo and Durango, with an entrance at 8140 West Lone Mountain Road. Our focus is to win the lost, connect them to Jesus and His church, train them in the Word of God, and help them find their place in the work of the Lord. Our service times are 10.45 a.m. and 6 p.m. on Sunday and 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-631-5027. That's 631-5027. Or you can visit our website, www.wellspringministries.com.